Welcome to the DeFi Standard, and this is Mickey B. Fresh and Patty XRP. And we got some amazing news today. Our fifth F asset is being added to the Flare network, and that is Algorand's native token, Algo. So this is going to be the fifth of the F assets once Flare launches. Now they're going to be testing this on the Songbird network. But what do you think of this, Patty? Now we have five going into the Flare network launch here. Yeah, so I mean, I think there'll probably be some differing opinions on this for sure. And I can't really begrudge anybody for which way to go with this. But, um, you know, I see it as potentially a great way to integrate the Algorand community in what Flare is doing, you know, with interoperability and all that kind of stuff. And in this webinar, where we'll go over a few of the clips. Um, you know, Hugo really did talk about using some of the core protocols on Flare on other blockchains as well. Uh, also, when he talks about working with Algorand, like he's hoping that, you know, there'll be some synergies between the two networks and, you know, it'll bring value to both through this. We also know that uh, Borderless Capital, which is one of the main funds behind Algorand, is an investor in the Flare Limited team. So I imagine that because they you know, decided to go live with Songbird, that this gave them additional time to do more things that they wanted to. And while I know they had originally said like back in May or June that they wouldn't be adding any new F assets until launch, that was prior to the decision that was made to launch the Songbird network. So I really think more than anything, it's like something they wanted to do, but didn't think they would have the time to do it. And now that they're going through this testing, fra testing phase uh, on you know, the Canary network that is Songbird, I think it just gave them more time to do that. And, you know, also kind of bridge those communities as well as, I mean, obviously they have the investment from borderless capital. So, you know, whatever you want to think of that, you can. Uh, I'll also add that, um, you know, possibly this dilutes the rewards from the F asset rewards pools. It looks like it may go into the general F asset rewards pool. That would be my guess at this point. But we are kind of still do a blog on what exactly the reward rates are going to be. What are the finalized pool amounts, which it seems like it might be less than the 20 billion that they had projected for the general F asset pool back in January, just based on how the supply was distributed on Songbird and using that to back into the Flare network. So I can definitely see people being upset about that because we've waited longer and longer. And also now, you know, possibly the rewards are going to get diluted. Now, I don't know how many. If Algo are going to be minted, I don't really think it would compete with how much FXRP is going to be minted. I think that's going to be by far the greatest one. However, you know, we could be wrong with that. I just haven't seen anything that indicates that greatly other than interest from like the Algorand developer and, you know, VC community at this point. Yes. And I do want to stress here that Flare Limited being the creators of the Flare Network and Songbird, you know, they have the right and the ability to uh, set up the network as they see fit to launch it. But I want to stress this point right here that's so important for the Flare Network and everything that's moving forward is once Flare Network launches, it's completely community governance, which means Flare is not going to just announce which F assets go live. It's going to be up to community vote and everything is going to be decided by governance. This is basically one of the last decisions that will be made by the Flare Limited team and they decided on this based on their VC investors and what they think is right to launch the network. You know, that's their right as the creators of it. Uh, we didn't invest in this network. They're building it and basically handing it out, handing it off to the community and that decentralized governance. So everyone who's a Spark owner is going to have a vote to be able to participate. So even if they set what Patty said, the distribution out of the general rewards pool at 0.2%, you know, a couple months later, we as a community can change that. And additional F assets will only be added from the community vote. There's no unilateral decisions that Flare can make limited after the network goes live. And that's very important to understand here. So I see people on Twitter saying, oh, can we have this as our next F asset, our next F asset? Well, if you want that, build up a lot of Spark tokens, put a proposal, and then put it to a vote. And that's really what's going to come down to of how the network evolves. So it's going to be very different than uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and XRP of how the governance takes place. And moving forward, we'll be able to decide uh, how the general rewards pools distribute rewards and which assets are brought on as F assets in the future. 
But I think it's a really good start here, Patty, because we have a proof of work network with Litecoin that they've integrated with already and brought over. We have a federated Byzantine agreement networks with Stellar and the XRP Ledger. And now we're gonna have a proof of stake smart contract network that's gonna be integrated. So basically that allows for all the integrations to be done with the main three types of consensus models that are out there. So easily be able to conform to other ones moving forward in the future. And I think that's really what's important and having Songbird as a test net now. So now all this could be done through the state connector system, which allows the integration into these blockchains. And you don't have to ask Algo permission. There's no permission asked to XRP ledger. They just integrate and don't even do anything to change the underlying chains. They don't even know the state connector system is actually there. So this is just, it's a truly amazing technology they built. And this is why Songbird is being, is launched right now to do all this testing. And we're in the middle of the state connector testing. And then next will be the F asset uh, testing on the Songbird network. Yeah, and I'll add, Mickey, that actually was a great point you brought up that I didn't think about. The fact that we have Doge and Litecoin, which are proof of work. Then we have, uh, you know, Stellar and the XRPL, which are their, you know, kind of form of Byzantine agreement. And then additionally, now we have proof of stake. And I do remember, like, a, this is a, from a while back, like maybe six months ago, Hugo made a comment one time that basically said, like, once you integrate with, you know, one form of consensus with the F asset system, that it becomes easier to do it again uh, with another network that uses a similar consensus mechanism. So that could be another reason. I mean, on top of, you know, them having time or the part, you know, the partnership or the investment from borderless capital or, you know, them talking to the Algorand developer community, uh, you know, also like it was definitely looking like it was going to be the first one proposed out the gate. And, you know, now they already have it figured out how to hook into a proof of stake network. So the three main types, like you said, are going to be there. But with that, Mickey, I want to take it into the first video clip so you can kind of hear what Hugo has to say about F assets in general, as well as the addition of Algo. Launch the, the, the assets that you're looking to sort of bring to the network are um, XRP, Stellar, um, Litecoin, and Doge. Um, do you have, what, what are your plans behind sort of this launch cohort that you can speak to? So um, I think I can give you a, a, like an exclusive. Uh, we're going to integrate Algorand before Flare goes live. Um, oh, cool. So we, we're quite excited by that. Um, we, you know, we, we, we like the Algorand network. Uh, we're very keen on the, you know, the Algorand team, talk to them quite a lot. Uh, we just think there's a, a, a great potential to use Algo, DeFi, and other applications on Flare. So we'll be integrating Algorand before uh, b before Flare goes live. Um, so it's going to be the fifth asset. Um, and then uh, once Flare goes live, you know, we'll be using governance, uh, you know, or we will be using governance to propose other assets, and anyone else can use governance to propose any other asset. So token holder governance. Um, we would expect... Uh, the Cardano would be something that people, you know, the ADA token would be something that people put forward through governance. We would certainly expect that Bitcoin would be a governance-based proposal. Bitcoin Cash, um, again, you know, it's just the, the, the larger tokens. I would even expect at some point that some of the larger ERC-20s and maybe even Ethereum uh, itself could be uh, potentially subject to a governance proposal. But let's see. Yeah, so, so it, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I just want everyone to understand that the more F assets that are added, that means that more Spark collateral is needed. So two and a half times the value of all these F assets. So say it be any one of these five that are brought over, you're going to need two and a half times that value in Spark locked up in the collateral system. So what does this do? It brings a deflationary, a very strong deflationary uh, component to the Flare network. And I know people have talked about, oh, there's inflation, the 3% every month, and the 10% for the FTSO rewards. But now, the more value that's brought onto the network, the more Spark that is locked up. And those who lock the Spark up are also going to be able to earn the FTSO rewards. And we're going to talk more about this inner and outer economies that the Flare network creates. Cool. And yeah, Mickey, I just want to add from that clip, you know, he very explicitly states that, you know, he's hoping there's some overlap between the applications and DeFi between Flare and Algorand. So, 
you know, that could be another reason. What if, you know, they have a project that wants to go multi-chain or something like that, and it can utilize F-Algo on Flare and maybe derive some value back to the Algorand blockchain. I mean, these are things we'll have to see, uh, but obviously they didn't really touch on the Flare team, like well, on, on why they opted to do it. I would also add uh, at the end, it was pretty interesting when in, he said um, potentially, you know, governance votes for Ethereum and ERC-20 tokens. Um, so you can think of like some big DAP tokens, maybe Uniswap, uh, Urine Finance, stuff like that on Ethereum that those could be added in the future. And that was something I had been wondering about if we were just going to see native assets potentially added as F assets to the Flare network. Um, well, it seems like, you know, he's already thinking about that. It, we may, it may come to a day where there's a proposal to add some DAP tokens in the future. And this is all up to the community. It's all mm -hmm. up to the Spark holders. So the more value that is brought onto the Flare network, the more value the Spark token has to be. So this is a very important concept here. And it's different than staking where, okay, you stake the tokens and they're locked up and that decreases the supply. But it's, there's a ceiling there of only so much could be done. And that's really to secure the network. You lose the utility of those tokens. Where with this, you don't lose the utility. Those Spark that are locked up as collateral, they still have delegatable votes that could go to the signal providers. So you could earn in two ways those tokens. And that's really going to be important going forward. And one thing with Algorand, why I think Algorand, um, like Borderless Capital and some of the VCs and applications, uh, want this is because Algorand doesn't have the Ethereum virtual machine smart contracts. They have their own custom Great smart point. contracts, which is built for, you know, tokenization and payments and for what they're doing, but it doesn't have, and it hasn't gained the adoption that the EVM based chains have. So now this opens Algo up to be used in the Ethereum virtual machine based smart contract apps. And we know that's where pretty much 90% of the development is taking place and why Flare is going to probably be very successful versus a lot of these other just custom smart contract networks that might be great and do awesome things. But right now, like Hugo said, Ethereum virtual machine, that's the standards. So when we think of Ethereum, the best of Ethereum is really the smart contracts. And Flare has that. And even XRP Ledger sidechains will have it. So um, I, I think it's really good that we're bringing communities together. And we have to understand that that this is a community effort with Flare. And it's not just kill Ethereum. It's bringing all this value onto Flare and unlocking it and then creating interoperability between these networks. Yeah, I mean, we could see composable, you know, projects or protocols built between, you know, Flare and even Ethereum in the future. So, you know, I really think we're going to move past kind of, you know, oh, which blockchain has the most market cap? I mean, that just seems like, I don't know. To me, it seems pretty pointless as opposed to like what's trying to be done with blockchain and crypto in general. And I feel like it's just a very short term view. So I imagine that, you know, we're already seeing like Algorand has smart contracts and they want to integrate, obviously, for different reasons than maybe Ethereum. But maybe because the Ethereum blockchain is slower or maybe because it you know has trouble moving to proof of stake 2.0, maybe there would be reasons for that. Um, I'm just speculating there, but, you know, we'll have to see what happens. So I'll take us in to this next clip, Mickey. And these next two clips are um, pretty interesting. Honestly, the the whole webinar, if you guys haven't seen it, Hugo, or sorry, Flare Community actually did a um, live broadcast of it, so you can rewatch it there. But here is the next one. We've learned kind of the hard way on Oracle a few times. Um, it's, it's, it's definitely hard. I think that one of the biggest problems on Ethereum was the, the slowness of them. Which is really, you know, difficult. But at the same time, you know, I think we got lucky. We got really lucky because we don't use proof of stake, um, which means that we don't need a token to secure the network. We don't need you to stake your token to secure the network. Um, and so we don't base our consensus on proof of stake. We don't need that. We base actually the Oracle system on a form of proof of stake. So. That then allows us to basically, you know, if people are very, you know, prepared to say that, you know, we can base an entire network on proof of stake, we say that's probably a core idea. Um, but we have, we think that we can, we're essentially using staking to entirely create prices for for what is a, a, a useful system that provides utility. Uh, and 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 so I think we just got very lucky there, just in our structure, just kind of 
popped out of the fact that we're not using proof of stake. So, um, and yeah, uh, we definitely tried to learn from a lot of things. Uh, really, for us, it was a lot about trying to make it genuinely decentralized. And right now we have 15% of the tokens delegated. Uh, I think over, over 30,000 people delegating, um, which is fairly decentralized as far as I can tell. Is there, I mean, um, what, what's, what's in place or what's in plans for tooling kind of around the oracles? Is there going to be dashboards and, and visualizations yeah. for how the so price we've, or... we've been really lucky. So, oh, cool. I guess there wasn't any more with that. Um, he was going to say Bifrost. In yeah. Flare Metrics, right? Yeah. yeah. And so Bifrost is one of the fastest growing wallets in history. I think it had something like, he said, 40 or 50,000 downloads. So it's it's really great to see the XRP community embracing this, and we already and this is only the you know Canary Network, and a lot of people haven't even got their tokens yet, and we're at forty thousand wallets for Bifrost, which is amazing. And to add on to what he said here, Patty, that by not using proof of stake, it really opens up so many uh, new possibilities, but it also um, uh, is a positive and beneficial way to distribute the token. So if anyone's seen DAI videos and Joseph Lubin talking, they said, well, Ethereum is probably going to be the number one winner because it's so difficult to distribute the token and get the native token out there. Well, Flare has found three ways to distribute the token natively that Ethereum didn't have to do through a private sale. We had an airdrop. The inflation rewards are distributed to those who uh, delegate their votes to signal providers. And then the third way is to reward those who mint F assets on the network. And those three distribution mechanisms is really powerful doing all of that without any private token sale or anything like that. And it's adopting a community that already exists with hundreds of thousands of users already. And we could see tens of thousands download the wallets. So we're really starting on a base here and a foundation of community and technology that is ahead of its time, in my opinion. Yep, I absolutely hear that, Mickey. And I just want to add, so when he was talking about the FTSO system there and staking, it's because it follows a similar economic model as staking does. So one of the ones what Polkadot uses is nominated proof stake where individual token holders can stake, you know, basically they nominate individuals to do like the validation of transactions and stuff with the validators on Polkadot. You can kind of think like when you're delegating, that's, basically the same function as nominating signal providers to deliver price feeds. Um, you get rewarded based on their accuracy of doing that, or at least the perceived accuracy by the FTSO. So it's just like a similar economic model. And like Mickey said, you know, they have multiple mechanisms to distribute the token fairly to participants of the network. Um, so yeah, I think that's uh, pretty great. And, you know, it is interesting to me that he, you know, he said, you know, we are lucky that proof of stake didn't end yeah. up being our consensus <laughs> because obviously they looked at doing that, you know, with the way he said that. So I, it's just interesting that, you know, they opted to go with federated Byzantine agreement. And then throughout the process, they realized that, hey, this economic model for proof of stake is actually really, you know, solid and working well for many projects for delivering the inflation of the token to have some kind of core function done. You know, just in this case, it's not for security, where if, you know, that the staking token doesn't inflate enough in price that, you know, there can become issues with security on the network. You know, this just has to do with the quantity of the tokens being delivered to the FTSO. So it doesn't necessarily have to do with value. It's more about the count of the tokens. Mm -hmm. And also, I just want to add in there that you don't have to give up custody of your Songbird or your Spark when you're delegating your votes to the signal providers. Like some proof of stake systems, you do give up custody like Polkadot, but in Algorand, you don't give up custody. You hold it in your wallet and that's still proof of stake. So this system that Flare built, you maintain custody and you just wrap it with a smart contract and you delegate a contract call vote to that signal provider over, certain, over an epoch, uh, which is many time series. So very interesting design here and it puts a decentralized Oracle system at the heart. And Vitalik Buterin has, has described what Flare has built 
as one of the biggest problems in the industry, and he described how to solve it with an incentive reward mechanism, just like Flare built. But most networks, they need the proof of stake. They need the native token to secure the network. So you don't have that ability to take the token and now reward uh, people for providing accurate price feeds. So this is like what he said, lucky, but I think it was just uh, the brilliance of the design opened up these new possibilities, then bootstrapping to a community and then having the state connector system, which is now going to allow us, I think in the next video clip, to show how we have trustless bridges, the truly first ever trustless bridges, not multi-sig where they could be hacked and interoperability like the, um, what was that, the poly network and other systems that, you know, are very uh, fragile. This system is trustless where you'll never have to trust any one custodian with your assets and you'll always be able to redeem that asset back or the value of that asset at all times because it's built into the protocol and building a state connector system literally signals the data back. So that's where we get the Flare network name from is it's signaling back data to the Flare network from the underlying blockchains without changing those underlying chains or forcing them to adopt any other type of protocol. They could stay as is, they don't even know the state connector system is there, which is really brilliant of how Flare designed this. So any other networks we wanna add as Spark owners, we just add, we don't have to ask for approval or do anything from that network. We just integrate and that's it. Yep, and so to get into the next one, here we go. Launch the, the, the assets that you're looking to sort of bring to the network are um, XRP, Stellar, um, Litecoin and Doge. Um, do you have, what, what are your plans behind sort of this launch cohort that you can speak to? So um, I think I can give you a, a, like an exclusive. I put in the wrong video there. That's I'll okay. Let's move on one. to the other video. Well, that was the last one. That was the last one. Okay. Two. So I'm going to go through the F assets. Now, the, the next video clip that I was going to use, we'll use in the next video we do. He talks about how these trustless bridges have never been created. And people talk about, you know, interoperability. Most of them are between just EVM smart contract networks. They're not truly trustless bridges to allow value to move onto other blockchains. And especially not with networks like Litecoin, uh, Stellar, and XRP, and Doge. Those, they don't really have much that you could do with their value. So what does Flare said from the beginning we're doing? We're unlocking value and financial energy. And that's really what's going to be done on the Flare network. And when that happens, it benefits all the Spark holders. And, you know, at the core is this decentralized Oracle system. So you can imagine, Patty, what are some of the things that could be built upon this F asset system and this decentralized uh, time series oracles. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think like cross-chain derivatives, things with having to do with cross-chain liquidity, Hugo even alluded to it in this webinar that he had. Um, you know, additionally, it seems like all these core protocols, so the F asset system, um, the FTSO and the state connector system can also, you know, in some ways be utilized by these other blockchains, you know, whether it's using the FTSO to deliver price feeds cross chain to, you know, Ethereum or Algorand or Cosmos or something like that. So I think that's pretty great that, you know, it can integrate in that way. And let's also not forget about the F asset system is that, you know, it doesn't necessarily just lock the native asset in a smart contract. It's sitting there at like the layer one level with, you know, in the basic address that has to do with um, that blockchain. So, you know, that's stuff that hasn't really been hacked before. You know, nobody's hacking into an address on a blockchain, like on Bitcoin or the XRP ledger, unless they attain your private keys or your seed phrase. Um, so for me, that's a lot safer as far as where it's staying, um, as opposed to maybe locked in a smart contract where we do see these smart contract bugs um, that result in loss of funds. Yeah, and having the state connectors, basically having a UNL of Flare validators on each underlying blockchain, and then they compete for a uh, incentive, a little of the reward that's part of the inflation to signal that data back accurately and fastest. So that's how you're able to verify everything that's going on on the XRP ledger at any basically moment in time on Flare. So it could read the state of all these blockchains. And this is something kind of unheard of. And you've seen like 
um, middleware layers trying to do this, but nobody's ever been able to really accomplish this on the layer one. And like what Patty said, those three core protocols, the FTSO system, the state connector, and the F assets, that's like at the heart of the Flare network. And I know everyone looks at like the tokens, and yes, the native token is important, but you gotta understand where is the value gonna be derived from is the utilization in these protocols and then the applications built on top of them and you know different derivatives, synthetics, cross-chain liquidity you could think of. You know, like moving more into an uh, uh, interoperable layer one uh, world here where applications will just run on top. We could see Compound and Aave on many blockchains. So there's no longer a need for them to stay on just Ethereum. But having the Oracle system, Patty, I really think is the biggest benefit for Flare. And it also gives us this no risk yield. I mean, there's not many other tokens that come out that have inbuilt no risk yield attached to them out the gate um, and are distributed far and wide. And the network's decentralized. So these are the things that, you know, Patty and I have researched and we see this is why the network's gonna be very successful. It's not like a gamble and hey, we'll hope for the best. No, we know these facts. This is how it's built. These are the things that are gonna derive value. The more F assets that are minted on Flare, the more value that gets locked up. So what is really the use case for Spark? It's as pristine collateral on the network. Absolutely. Um, well, Mickey, I don't know if, I didn't really have any much more else to add if you had anything, but I think that was no, pretty good No, just that overview. liquid democracy, yeah. you know, take these announcements that this is probably the last announcement that is gonna be made by like Flare Limited that dictates something being added to Flare. Everything else, once the network is launched, is up to you, me, Patty, and everyone else who owns Spark. It's gonna be a liquid democracy and it's gonna be community governed. So there's nobody you're gonna get mad at for adding that F asset or not adding it. We're gonna be a community. And finally, we'll have a chance to govern our network. And I think that's gonna be a big transition in mindset for coming from the XRP community where we always look to Ripple and consensus and governance different. We have a, a, a role to play here, not just in delegating, but participating in governance. And that adds to the utility of Spark. One vote, one token. So the more Spark you build up, it's, it's a transferring of value as you earn these rewards from the FTSO and from the F asset system. It's a market mechanism to remove the power of the lazy people who don't participate and remove the people who don't you know, sell their tokens right away. They're out of the ecosystem. They have no influence. Their voice on Twitter means nothing. All that matters is the voice that you have inside the network when you could vote. And I think really that's what we're moving towards. And I know it's sometimes hard to see that right now because we're you know, dictated by exchanges releasing us our songbird and things like that. But that's soon gonna end and it's all gonna be up to the community. So we have to just brace for that and be prepared and it's gonna be a big transition for many people to understand that it's not up to the exchanges, it's not up to a central authority to dictate what happens to a network we participate in. It's actually ourselves, and we'll be able to have debates within the community. You know, I've seen a couple months from now, Patty and I come on here and we're discussing, hey, should the network do this and move in that direction? Do we want to incentivize the F asset minters with more yield? Is that something we need to do to get more F asset value on there, or is it we have enough value and we should lower it? Those are the things that community participation means and having a healthy debate. And this is why understanding the tech and understanding and having knowledge is going to be important going forward. And this is the whole transition of crypto, I think in large, the industry and the market is moving from, you know, just sitting there, I'm in it for the money, price goes up, I sell and moon, to now I'm participating. These are actually decentralized financial market infrastructures that things are gonna be built on top of. And we're gonna see this more and more moving forward. So it's exciting times ahead, Patty. Absolutely, uh, I think we can wrap it up there. So this is the DeFi Standard. I'm Patty XRP. And I'm Mickey B. Fresh. And we're out, see y'all.